terms of BAE Systems Australia as a business, so we're Australia's leading defence contractor. Um, what that means is we work on over 35 major defence contracts um, for the Australian Defence Force um, across their air, land and sea domains. We have about um, over 4,500 employees across Australia at the moment, um, with our head office being in uh, South Australia, but we've also got offices across uh, most other states um, in Australia. In terms of our early careers programs at BAE Systems, we have both a graduate program and an internship program. So um, our graduate program is open for applications at the moment until the 5th of April, um, and that will be for graduate role starting in February 2022. We also have um, an internship program which will open up later in the year, probably around about August, um, and therefore opportunities starting in November. Um, with all of our early careers programs, they are unfortunately restricted to Australian citizens only um, due to the defence security clearance requirements um, that we need to follow, um, such as saying that we need to consider for, for the, both of those programs. On, on that, Brenna, as well, before we jump off, um, in terms of dual citizens as well, does that impact that requirement at all if they're Australian citizen with another? Yeah. So. Yeah, it can do depending on um, the project that we're considering you for. Um, but what I would encourage here is if you are an Australian citizen with some dual nationality, still feel free to put in an application because we can do an independent assessment to see what impact um, that may have, if any, on, on the projects that you can or can't work on. Yeah, so best to bring, rather than, rather than talking through each individual circumstance here on the q and I think yeah. if, if, if you do have questions about that particular requirement, yeah, make sure to bring that up in the recruitment process itself. Um, anyway, sorry, Brenna. Definitely. Thank you for that. Yeah, it literally is a case by case situation and it can vary on how long you're in that country um, and a range of other factors as well. So it is better if we if we talk through that in the recruitment process. Thanks, Sam. Alrighty, in terms of the graduate program that we offer, um, so it's a two year graduate program that we bring you in um, into the company on. So you'll start off as a graduate, you'll go through some structured placement rotations um, and then like Ed, you will exit into a position within the business. Throughout your time um, as a graduate in our program, there's obviously training and development, mentoring, um, and some really great opportunities to collaborate with um, not only graduates, but other employees across, across the company as well. So um, hopefully Ed and I will be able to talk to you some more about some of the features of the program um, in some of your questions. In terms of the internship program, so that's a paid 12-week um, placement over the summer. Um, we do use our internship program as a feeder into our graduate program. So if you come in and um, love working for us as much as we love having you here, we do look to appoint you into the graduate program as well via um, a fast track option as well. And as I promised, that was very, very quick, um, but we did want to allow plenty of time for questions um, and that sort of thing. So maybe while people are thinking, if Ed, you just want to introduce yourself, um, yeah. Yep. Hello. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. It's the afternoon, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, what time is it? <laughs> um, my name's Ed. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, formerly a graduate mechanical engineer. I'm joining you from, from Melbourne today, which is where I've worked for the last two years for BAE. So I graduated university. I went to um, University of Melbourne in for, for a while, but I graduated in, in 2018. Um, I studied mechanical engineering. I applied to the BAE graduate program, started working beginning of 2019. So I've been through um, those four rotations that Brenna mentioned earlier. So my, uh, maybe I'll go through the four that I did to give you an idea of, I think I'm, I'm a good example of the, the breadth of experience you can get across the two years. So I did, um, I started out working in our Williamstown office in maritime sustainment. I worked on the Anzac program on a kind of like an HVAC kind of upgrade to some of the ships uh, that we work on there. Uh, that thing ended up being cancelled by the government, which was kind of a weird uh, twist for my rotation to take. So I spent the rest of those six months doing some little odd jobs here and there, things like water coolers and heaters and piping and fire mains and all sorts of little bits and pieces of mechanical engineering, which was really cool. After those six months, I did a rotation in weapon systems in our Richmond office. I worked on NULKA, which some of you might have heard of. You can, you can Google it. It's N-U-L-K-A. Um, you can learn about all the stuff we're allowed to tell you about it uh, on there. It's a, it's a missile decoy system. Um, which is exactly as cool as it sounds. It was really, really fun. I got to do a whole lot of testing, vibration testing, thermal testing, and also um, a lot of work around kind of systems engineering, like 
requirements analysis and configuration order to those words mean anything to any of you and I can talk about them more a bit later if you want to ask me some questions. Uh, and then my third rotation, um, so this is beginning of last year, so this is when things are starting to get really fun uh, with regard to lockdowns. Um, I was technically back in the Williamstown office, but I spent most of that time at home. Uh, I was a production engineer working back in maritime, um, maritime side of the AE. So I spent a lot of time developing processes for things like supply chain and getting project managers and engineers and drafts people to liaise properly with each other to make sure sort of any sort of upgrade that goes onto a Navy ship, which is one of the one of the platforms we work on, the, uh, the Anzac class again. Um, any sort of upgrade going on there has the right number of parts arriving at the right time and those sort of issues there, um, which is a lot of, a lot of software based sort of stuff, sort of working on upgrades to the, the tools that people use to get those, those jobs done. So I did that for about six months, then took kind of a, a hard left turn and went into safety engineering for six months. So I was a graduate product safety engineer was my title for the, the second six months of 2020. Um, I worked on a program called HFS, which stands for high frequency surveillance, which is like a radar kind of based program. This is something I had no idea about really, but even existed within the company. And I was lucky enough to jump into it. Um, so I spent that time doing sort of hazard logs, um, managing safety working groups, basically anything to do with safety around the, the products that we were putting out, which a part of HFS was a program of, I think maybe nine or 10 different projects, all of which had their own unique safety requirements and so forth. So I worked with one other safety engineer across all of that. We were a two person team for, you know, however many millions of dollars that thing was worth in charge of the safety for it. So that was a lot of fun. Um, that was a lot of, again, a lot of liaising with sort of project subject matter experts identifying kind of key product safety risks and their consequences and ways to mitigate them and, and so forth. So working a lot with like the government um, sort of health and safety regulations and stuff. Um, and now um, it's been about a month and a half since I finished the graduate program. So I finished around uh, beginning of February this year. I'm now just a mechanical engineer, the graduate has regrettably dropped off my, my Outlook title. So now I can't use that as an excuse when I screw something up. But other than that, it's been a lot of fun. I've uh, I've moved back into Nolka again. So I'm in the, the in-service support part of Nolka, which means any sort of issue that comes up with the system gets sent back to us. And we work on things like obsolescence and testing little bits and pieces for circuit boards and um, other little, that's, that sounds sort of electrical, but there's some mechanical stuff in there as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me for the last sort of two years at BAE, hopefully at least one thing I said there interests you. And if it does, by all means, you can ask me about it and I'm happy to tell you anything I can. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ed, for a good sort of overview there of yourself. Um, let's, I reckon let's just jump right in now into the main part that everyone's probably quite excited for, which is the Q&A part of the live Q&A. Um, so how, how we want to do this, if you can start to put your questions in the chat function itself. There's a couple already coming through, which is fantastic. If you can also mess mention in that when you post your question, whether or not you're happy to take yourself off mute. Um, Cause I know Brenner and Ed are particularly keen to see some faces, hear from you directly. We really wanna make this as much of a conversation as possible. If your microphone's broken or you don't feel comfortable taking yourself off mute, that's, that's quite okay. Just let me know when you write that chat, your question in the chat whether you want me to read it out on your behalf. Uh, just because I'll have, you know, there's a hundred or so people in the event today. I'm conscious we're gonna have a lot, a lot of questions, which is gonna be great. Um, but I just wanna, I'll, I'll be sort of, you know, jumping through them as we come through. Um, the first question I can, there was already one that's already been addressed by Brenna there about the internship process. So that's coming, I, there's, there's a link in there if you are interested about when the internship will go live. But there's a question here from Heath. Um, regarding the requirements of the internship program. I'm not sure if Heath, you wanted to take yourself off mute um, and sort of expand on that question a, a bit further or? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm thinking about looking to apply for um, uh, Bay Systems uh, internship program. I'm just wondering what are the uh, requirements to apply? Do I need to be second year? Do I need to have the degree already? Yeah. Um, so great question. So our internship program is normally targeted at people in their penultimate year of study. Um, so in their second to last. Um, however, from time to time, we might be able to consider people earlier in that journey. Um, it just depends on yeah the role and, and what they're looking for at the moment. Um, in terms of eligibility. So as I mentioned before, Australian citizen uh, citizenship is key. Um, other things that we look for would be um, your degree, so area of study and, um, you know, what sort of subjects you've been um, involved in. 
Uh, we also look at, you know, what sort of work experience you've had to date um, and what sort of extracurricular activities you've been involved in as well. Got a thumbs up there. So hope that answered your question. I might throw to Chi next, a question for Ed. Um, again, Chi, if you're happy to take yourself off mute, otherwise I can ask that one for you. Uh, it's, yeah, you can ask him for me. I mean, there wasn't much else to add other than what I wrote in the chat. Okay, so this is how well did you feel uni prepared you for your graduate role? What experience did you feel help you land the role? Personally, I did live outside of uni, so I have a hard time. Yeah. Seeing which, okay. Um, hmm. Well, I can tell you, I can tell you the experience I had that I, I suppose was successful in, in getting me a role PAN. And again, this is this is 2018 applications. I'm not sure how the requirements, you know, dynamics, and number of people applying, and all of that has shifted since since then. Um, but I, like I said, I've been at uni for five and a half years at that point. So Melbourne Uni, those of you who don't know, um, it's a bit of a weird uni structure. You do an undergrad and a postgrad, and it takes you five years because um, you get a cross credit of a year. So I'd pretty much done all of that. I had decent um, results. I had about a like an HD-ish average across my subjects, I think. I'm not sure how well that comes into it. I don't know if there's a cutoff or anything how that works. I'm sure Brenda could tell you more about that. But in terms of experience, um, I did a little bit of uh, extracurricular stuff. I was on like a space program thing as part of uni and I'd done one internship. So I spent three months in an, an HVAC program as a mechanical engineer, which funnily enough, I ended up on an HVAC project when I first joined BAE. But to say that I used any of that experience directly is would, would be a lie. Like I've, I, would, I wouldn't say I went in there applying like a building engineering experience in, into BAE. Um, in terms of what experience as I felt helped me land the role, it's hard to know, right? Because any if you if you get an offer for a job, right? How do you know what part of you they liked? <laughs> That's it's kind of a weird thing to say. It's like, oh well, I must have done something right. I suppose if I had to guess, I think I'm a fairly proactive, positive, energetic person. I try and learn things as quickly as I can. I think that's probably one of the most important things for any job ever, really, not just an engineer or graduate or whatever, but it's being able to pick up skills and apply them quickly because like all of you would have heard a million times already, all the stuff you learn in uni, it's great, especially in engineering, but as to whether you're going to directly apply some really specific fluid mechanics equation in every job that you get, you're probably not. Um, but as to whether you can learn how to learn things quickly and pick things up quickly when you get into a, a professional environment like working at BAE, um, I think that's probably an important skill to have. I might be able to jump in here and add some insights into um the types of things that recruiters look for um, as part of the recruitment process. So um, what you'll probably find is this will be quite consistent across many employers, so not just BAE, because there's all there's quite often common themes um, of things that we look for. So um, in, in the first question, I spoke about some of the things that we look for um, in terms of eligibility for internships, and it's much the same for graduates. So um, as I said, Australian citizenship is, is one key one for us because um, if we can't get you a defence security clearance, um, you wouldn't be able to work on uh, the majority of the projects that we have. Um, the second thing that we look at is degree and GPA. Um, so Ed there obviously mentioned he's, you know, quite a high achiever with, you know, mostly HDs and that sort of thing, which is fantastic. Um, but for us at BA Systems, we don't focus on kind of GPA alone. So we're really looking for well-rounded graduates and interns to join our company and our teams. Um, and what we mean by well-rounded is, um, you know, they're going to be able to come in the team, um, come into our teams and communicate effectively with their team members. Um, so not only other graduates, but, you know, maybe senior technical people, junior technical people and everyone else in between. Um, we want you to be able to think critically and on your feet. We know that, you know, the times we live in now are very, very fast paced and always, things are always changing. So the ability to really be adaptable um, and, you know, just always on your feet um, is really, really good for us. Um, we like to look at what sort of work experience you've done. So this could be anything from your job at Macca's, Hungry Jack's KFC through to, you know, internships with Department of Defence, DSTG and that sort of thing. Um, what we find is, you know, if you've done internships um, or work experience with kind of defence companies or just defence industry, um, that obviously shows to us an interest and a desire to work for the defence force. So 
Um, uh, for us, a lot of it is values driven. So looking at, you know, your alignment with, with our values and with our behaviours. Um, so our three key behaviours, uh, three key values, sorry, is to be bold, trusted and innovative. So we're always looking for those, um, those to be kind of demonstrated within your application. Uh, and the final thing that we like to look at is extracurricular activities. So even if you're not working, what sort of extra things are you doing to help you develop your skill sets and, and maintain those? So, um, you know, do you lead a student society group? Uh, are you doing some volunteer work? Um, you know, are you a captain, captain of a sports team? What are those extra things that you're doing that make you, um, you know, the best candidate for the job? So not just technically, but um, behaviourally as well, because for us, it's it's the combination that we're, we're looking for. This is a fun question to hear because it lets me reconsider whether I'd get this job again if I applied for it again. <laughs> awesome. Um, I might throw to, and apologies to everyone on the call, I'm a shocker at pronunciation. So if I get your name wrong, I'm very, very sorry. But I might throw to Anastasios, um, question about the project management stream there, I think. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Anastasios. I hope you can hear me. I, yes. I'm sorry I can't actually enable my video because I'm on my way to class and almost in the train station. No uh, so I just wanted to ask, uh, I heard uh, Ed was talking about uh, different sort of projects that he has been involved in in the past. So I was wondering where there are any specific methodologies that are followed across BAE's uh, projects because for instance when you have the agile project environment you get the project managers to work as uh, either scrum masters uh, product owners or even uh, program managers and then on the waterfall style of execution you you have the classic uh, sort of structure yep yep that's a good question that i can probably jump in on so in terms of the methodology that we use it can vary across our organization um, so because of the, the very large number of projects we work on, there are some different styles um, that seem to take place. So I think Agile is probably um, one of the more common ones, but there are definitely teams that still use Waterfall um, and, and some of those as well. No worries. Thank you. No worries. Help if I took myself off mute. Um, I might throw <laughs> to Sean next with another question for Ed. Sorry, Sean Coots, I think you said you're happy to take yourself off mute, but if you're... Maybe he's left already. <laughs> <laughs> I can That's ask all... the question anyway. Um, maybe yeah, if Sean wants to watch the recording or something. <laughs> oh, hey, hang on. Can you hear you? Oh, sorry, was it for Sean Runner? Uh, it was for... If you're happy to... I mean, Sean, if you've got another one, I mean, can you, take, you, can, you can answer. Can you hear me? Oh, there we yes. go. There's Sean Coots. Yeah, sorry. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, yeah, <laughs> okay. so... My question for Ed there was, uh, what's the most difficult challenge you sort of faced in your graduate program at Bay Systems? And what support were you given to tackle that challenge from your mentors or the other, other experienced engineers that you're working with? Okay. Most difficult thing I've done at BAE. I mean, I've done a lot of difficult things. Uh, I've tried to do a lot of difficult things as to whether I achieved them. I guess that's someone else's opinion. Um, but... I, I guess two things come to mind. So one was kind of a combination of circumstances got it kind of outside what I was expected to do. Um, so I, as part of my second rotation, which was this weapon systems, NOLCA, active missile decoy thing, um, I just as a result of the scheduling that was going on when I arrived in the program, because you, the way generally it works with, with at least BAE rotations is there's a set date that they try to adhere to with when you were basically dropped into the next project or next rotation that you're doing. So it's literally like a Friday, you're on one thing and a Monday, you could be on the next thing. There might be a bit of handover and, you know, a couple of meetings here or there. But in this case, that was basically what happened to me. So I went from um, a different office and a different section of the business. So from Maritime in Williamstown into weapon systems in Richmond, I met an entire new team of people. I pretty much knew no one there, but my manager, I think, I, mean, I hadn't actually met my manager when this thing happened to me. Um, I'd only been speaking to him over the phone because of this hectic scheduling that was happening. So at this time, there was a whole lot of testing going on. Um, we had basically to do a whole lot of qualification stuff. I mentioned it earlier, there's like thermal and vibration testing and stuff. Most of the equipment for which is actually in Adelaide, uh, when a lot of the people who work on it are in Melbourne. And so there were people just flying back and forth between Melbourne and Adelaide constantly 
to supervise all oh, my screens just turned off to supervise uh, these things. And it just happened that I, I was the guy who I think maybe two weeks into this role when I was still learning what the system was and, you know, reading documentation and stuff, I had to go and supervise a formally witnessed um, acceptance test procedure for this piece of electronics equipment that I pretty much had no, I barely even knew what the acronym was for at this point. And I had to spend a week in Adelaide uh, by myself doing that. And about halfway through that, I learned that I had to come back to Melbourne to attend a funeral. Uh, so I had to compress five days worth of work into, I think it ended up being about three and a half days before I had to run off to the airport. Um, so that was, uh, I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of words you could use to describe what that is. I mean, it's unlucky in, in a few ways. And also just, you know, not, not only because of, you know, unfortunate personal things, but also because um, it was just a, a hectic scheduling time and there was a lot of things trying to be done at the same time. Um, I think a lot of, I spent a lot of that time just randomly phone calling my manager and other people who were back in Richmond, who I actually knew to ask them just anything from, you know, how do I turn this thing on to what should I plug in here? I'm looking at this number or whatever. Um, so it comes back to, in terms of what support I've received, um, every team I've worked in at BAE has been extremely supportive to graduates, especially. You never feel like you're just being tossed, you know, for want of a better phrase, just, you know, shit, busy work for the the sake of it you're given generally stuff that you can actually take ownership of and work on so it's yeah you might get something like oh can you convert this like pdf into a different format word document or something fine sometimes that has to be done but um things like this like an actual tangible task that you would think of you know a real engineer doing was something that was handed to me and you get en enough support to sort of push through with it um so yeah that was one of the one of the hardest ones if i have time i might mention the other one um, towards the end of my graduate program, I was handed a human factors assessment for like a multi-million dollar project that I had to basically invent and then carry out as much as I could within the next month uh, and basically kickstart before I left the project to go to the job that I'm in now. Um, so human factors, I mean, maybe it's not even worth me explaining what it is because I didn't know what it was when I had to do it. I'd never heard of it. It's sort of like a tangential thing related to safety. And I was a safety engineer at the time. And uh, at least I was a safety engineer by title, but I was a, I'd studied mechanical engineering, right? So I was like two steps removed from what I was supposed to be doing, uh, if, if you want to read it that way. And that was a case of not even my manager really knew what we were supposed to be doing. But again, it comes back to recognizing the skills that you have and everyone around you recognizing where you're coming from and your background and what your issues are um, and taking it from there in terms of what's expected of you and how you can get the help you need um, and in that case it ended up just being a matter of casting my emails out into the the breadth of you know thousands of people who work at BAE until I eventually found out there was someone in like Fisherman's Bend or something, which I didn't even know we have people who worked there, but that's another office in, in Melbourne that we have people who work there uh, who works on human factors. And I ended up having a whole lot of meetings with this guy and he pretty much told me exactly what I had to do. And so that ended up being, you know, after about a few days of what the hell am I gonna do here? I've got to write a, a plan for something that I don't even know what it is. It turned into, you know, an example of, you know, cross program collaboration. So one of the, one of the great things about BAE in general and you might say one of, one of the worst things is that it's a huge company, so it can be hard to find what you're looking for, but you generally can find what you're looking for if you try to look for it. Awesome insight. Um, I've got some, I've got, there's a few questions in here about degrees. So I might just ask this more broadly to you, Brenna. Yeah. Um, yeah. Both for, I mean, I guess the intern program is a little while away, but in terms of the grad program particularly, mm. um, what sort of degrees are you looking for across the board? Uh, in particular streams you want to highlight as well? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what I might say to begin with is that um, all of our graduate opportunities are currently advertised on our website. So if you just type in, um, and I think I posted a link above BAE Systems Australia Graduate Program, that will take you through to um, a list of the opportunities. In terms of the disciplines that we're um, recruiting for at the moment, so engineering is um, always our biggest stream. So um, anything from software engineers, electrical electronics, uh, mechanical mechatronics systems, um, integrated logistics support. Um, there's some of our key um, engineering streams and I'm sure I've forgotten at least one. Um, we also look for project management graduates. So um, particular interest here is if you've done, you know, additional PM subjects or kind of postgraduate subjects in PM. 
Um, we've got some opportunities in finance, commercial, um, and also uh, supply chain as well. Um, so yeah, there's lots and lots of opportunities there. We quite often get asked, you know, if your degree is say for engineering outside of that, um, what we look for there. So we're not hard and fast, you know, if you're a mechanical engineer, we need you to have a mechanical engineering degree. Um, we look for those transferable skills. So, um, you know, if you've done some relevant subjects or specialised in a certain area, we can consider that as well. Hopefully that answered a few questions there. Um, I'm going to throw to um, Reese next, Reese Tirado, about the application process while we're on that, that whole tangent. Um, after that, I'm probably going to throw to Ali. Um, but Reese, if you're... Yeah, yeah. Um, so for both the grad program and the intern program, um, what's involved in the application process? So in terms of um, interviews and different stages and all that? Yep. Great question. And um, both, both processes are run um, quite similarly. So um, initially, it's a online application that we'll ask you to do. So um, that's done by our website, but we do advertise in um, loads of areas, so Grad Australia, Seek, um, LinkedIn, you know, those sort of places, but they'll all take you to do an online application. Um, from there, we do a initial shortlisting process. So the next step would be um, a pre-recorded one-way video interview. So um, that's probably um, dreaded by some, but if I don't don't take it too too seriously, we're just trying to find out some more about yourself and um, what you can bring to the team. So um, I haven't had to do one myself, thankfully. I can imagine it's a daunting process, but um, it is a really good way for us to kind of, you know, put a face to the name and start to understand a bit about yourself and, and what you can bring to the team. Um, and from there, we do the final shortlist. So um, the things that I was speaking about before, GPA, work experience, extracurricular activities, and the video interview help us get to that final shortlisting stage. Um, and it's at that point that the managers in our business will have a look and determine who um, who's best fit for an interview. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, we used to do face-to-face -face interviews. Um, last year, we went to WebEx interviews, which we actually found to be quite um, beneficial and effective because graduates could do it from the comfort of their own home. We could have um, hiring managers from any state um, attend and participate. Um, so it was quite convenient for all parties. Um, and from there, it's um, what I would call like a, a semi-normal recruitment process. So there's, um, you know, background checks that we need to go through um, we kick off the defence security clearance process for the graduates. Um, so that's quite a lengthy process. It can take up to six months for us to kind of work that through. Um, and I guess for us, that's why we do a lot of our recruitment activities this early in the year, because we need to allow that time to get that clearance in place. Um, and from there, it's um, just, yeah, final offer approvals and, um, yeah, formalising an offer. Great, thanks. Ali, I think there was a question about the like relocation and whatnot. Are you happy to ask that one for the team? Yeah, sure. So um, I guess like most companies, we do have a limited budget available for relocation. Um, so the areas that we typically look to utilise that in might be for regional locations um, or disciplines where the skill sets might not be um, as common. Um, but it is something that we can look at, but it, it, it is a case-by-case -case, um, basis and it is quite um, a small number of packages that we have available. So while we're on that, Brenna, can you just clarify where most of the graduate roles are lo located currently? Because I know that can change year to year. <laughs> it does change year to year. So um, our head office is in South Australia at Edinburgh Parks. Um, but we also do have the Hunter Class Frigate Program in Adelaide, which is um, starting to ramp up quite a bit. So um, most of our SA-based roles seem to be based between um, Osborne, Edinburgh Parks and the CBD. Um, in terms of the next location, probably Victoria. So um, Victoria and the CBD um, would be the next area. Um, we've got a few option opportunities in New South Wales, um, in Williamtown as well. Um, and this year we're also assisting um, Applied Intelligence who are our um, cybersecurity division with recruitment for their um, graduate opportunities. So they're in, um, you know, for ICT, type students and cybersecurity students um, across uh, Canberra, Victoria and New South Wales as well. I'm going to jump forward a little bit um, and I'll come back to a couple of questions prior to that. But why you mentioned locations in New South Wales, um, Michael Yanez, I think there's a you had a question here about the, the projects in New South Wales, if you want to take yourself off mute. 
Yeah, I'll come off mute. Yeah, I was just wanting to know an overview of the different projects maybe available to New South Wales applicants, uh, because BAE is mainly an uh, aerospace and maritime defense contractor. I'm wondering if we have maritime uh, in New South Wales, or is it mainly on the avionics of different uh, aircraft? Yeah, so we do have um, a combination in New South Wales. So um, we do a lot of aircraft and aircraft sustainment um, in Williamtown, New South Wales. So that's where the F-35s are. Um, in Garden Island, um, we do a little bit with DDG, um, which is about the, um, I'm trying to think what the acronym stands for. Um, Ed, do you? Uh, um, which one? Sorry, DDG. DDG. Um, it's a missile guided. I think that's one of the ones that's not actually an acronym and it stands for like, yeah, some sort of guided defense. Guided something. missile destroyer. Yeah. Yeah, that's, the that's one. it. <laughs> I think mean, so like one of us just Googled that. But yeah, there's a few of the ships <laughs> have got like FFH, FFG, DDG have acronyms that aren't really acronyms. It's confusing. Um, so yeah, we're a company that's full of acronyms for all sorts of different projects. So um, yeah, it could be tricky to, sometimes, tricky you to get an them. sometimes you get an acronym where one of the letters stands for another acronym. I've had a few of those. Those are rough. <laughs> when, you work on these, um, when you work on these missile systems, are they working mainly on the uh, avionics, as in like the uh, like flight path and stuff like that, or are you working on actual propulsion and container type uh, projects as well? Or yeah, uh, it depends on the project. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it's like subcontracting. Um, and did you say there's any graduate roles for Garden Island? Or is it mainly uh, for Garden Island, there is, um, but to be completely honest, I can't remember those off the top of my head. <laughs> but they'd be on our on our careers website. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry about that. There's uh, yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> There's a couple of. I know we've discussed it a little bit about citizenship mm -hmm. and, and and the like, but I might just double check something with you, Brennan, before I move yeah. on to. Um, here's a question from Stuart that I'm going to throw to you next. Um, but before I do that. Um, for anyone who doesn't have their citizenship yet, but are likely to get it this year, um, but potentially after the applications close, is that something that's okay, or is it something they should again raise with you in the recruitment process? Or yeah, so that that for us is a really tricky one because um, there's quite a lot of risk to the company um, in terms of considering your application before that's actually granted, um, and it can also throw a spanner in the works in terms of the timeline process um, for obtaining the defence security clearance. So there's usually at least a six month lead time um, to get the negative vetting level one, which we get for our graduates. Um, so I think. Um, what, what our normal advice is, is that you need to have that granted before your application. Um, but if you are going to get it in the next couple of weeks, it's probably worth reaching out um, just to see if it's a possibility. Awesome. Um, Stuart Caffarella, there's a question here yeah. for Ed, I believe. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, Ed, just to you specifically, I was kind of curious about, I suppose, the flexibility and freedom within the graduate program. Uh, I know you said you really like um, NOLCA and then you got to continue working on that after your graduate uh, program. Uh, was that your choice or did you get placed into that program? Here is where I have to be careful about how I describe how I ended up with this role as to what the, the correct way is according to the company and the way that I ended up doing it. Um, but in, in general, it, it is it ends up being a, a factor of your choice, that's you know, absolutely a part of it and quite a large part of it, um, at least in my experience and the experience of all the other grads that I know. It's, I don't know anyone who has just been thrown onto something that they had no interest in doing. Um, having said that, obviously there's the other side of the coin, which is, you know, is there room for you? Is there budget for you? Does this align with the skill set and sort of, you know, does this fit your career trajectory, if that makes sense? Like if you've done four rotations over two years of one particular really specific thing and suddenly you want to do a 180 and do something else you know are you going to be selected over somebody else in the graduate program who wants to do the same you know like we, we call we call it an exit role because you're exiting the graduate program into the into the um the actual i guess the actual company being a being a big boy and um so i was fortunate enough that the manager of this role that I'm in now was also the manager of the graduate role that I had. And he'd actually gone from just managing me. So the year that he was managing me was like the first time he managed anybody and he was managing one graduate and it was me. And then he 
became the happened to become a manager of you know 11 or 12 people and so we had a vacancy for a few I guess ex grads um and so I found out about that um just by you know looking around is, is all I would really want to say about that uh and I contacted him and there's a there's a process there's a formal process around it so there's a there's a form that gets filled in by you and um a person called your graduate functional manager who's like a manager you get for your entire graduate program and sort of helps you through all of your rotations and also your exit role so it isn't left entirely to your own devices to do it and it's also not left entirely up to the the business just to pick you as you know a number on a spreadsheet and chuck you in somewhere like it's a much more involved there are you know multiple conversations that happen throughout that throughout that um that course and you won't be certainly won't be left in the dark about how it um how it goes so in terms of did i get to choose um yes um would i say 100 percent of the time you can just pick something and go i want this and then the whole company will bend its will to sort of fit you in well no right but i think that's kind of unrealistic anyway right and i think you'd, you'd agree as well so yeah yeah that's perfect thank you very much Awesome. I'm going to throw next up because a question here from Jason. Um, but before I do that, though, just to, just to flag, just a reminder for everyone, um, if you can get your questions into the chat function and just let me know whether or not you're happy to take yourself off mute or not, um, just so I can help to um, call, call you out if need be or read it myself. Um, Jason, I think you had a question for Ed about mechanical design and R&D. You happy to take yourself off mute or? Yep, yep. I'm happy. Hi. <laughs> Um, hi, Ed. Um, I just wanted to ask about your experiences at BAE in terms of um, mechanical design work. So um, at the start, when you talked about your various placements in the grad program, um, it felt like you didn't do much mechanical design work and it seemed to be more about systems engineering and sustainment. Um, so I was wondering, is there much opportunity to get involved with mechanical design and R&D at BAE? Yep, very fair question. And you're absolutely correct, Jason. I didn't do a lot of mechanical design. The one project where I did get to do it was the one that I was on that was cancelled by the customer. But that was like a, it was a sustainment project, but sustainment in the sense that we were basically adding an entire new functionality into an existing platform if that makes sense so the whole the actual new functionality which unfortunately i can't talk about what it is but the thing that was going in was it didn't exist and had to be designed basically from the ground up so that's an example of where i guess we, we were designing it, it didn't end up happening but it does happen um in terms of fully r d like design based parts of the business they do exist um there's a section called red ochre labs that exists um out of a bridge road office and soon to be another office um that pretty much all you know entirely works within r d and developing new entirely new systems and trying to you know sell them off basically um a lot of that is they call it hardware engineering so it isn't purely mechanical but you'll do you know parts of mechanical engineering within that as well as you know a bit of electrical stuff yeah um so that's stuff that's stuff like um if you look up the autonomous m113 project um that's the remote control tanks. It's one of the one of the coolest things we do. Um, that's one of the R and D programs that we do. Yeah, yeah. The Red Ochre Labs program sounds pretty cool. Um, in particular, the hypersonics. Is yeah. that mostly based out of Victoria? To my knowledge, it's Victoria, and I think some of it's in South Australia. But I know people in Melbourne who work on it. So you know, I can tell you that at least some of it is in is in Victoria. Maybe Brenna can tell you a bit more. But yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. because I'm based in Adelaide. Sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say, Ed's absolutely right. So um, predominantly based in Victoria, but um, as, as it grows and ramps up a bit, there are, um, are becoming some positions in SA as well. Right. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I have a question to ask um, Nazia uh, from Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I want to talk, uh, I want to ask um, a question. Some of your um, positions for uh, graduate, like, you know, safety engineer, those are based in Barrow, I think. Th those are based in South Australia, right? So Barrow sounds like um, a location in the United Kingdom. Yeah. So um, yeah. we have, um, we are a worldwide organization, but we're, we're the Australian business. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's a separate position to um, to us. 
Yeah, but the graduate position includes those those positions, um, like you know, safety engineer position, uh, system engineer position. Uh, those those are also included in that uh, graduate program. So whenever I search those programs, um, like, you know, the positions based in U UK, they also appeared in the window. So uh, another question from me is like, you know, product safety engineer or the safety engineer, those positions are um, also available in Adelaide office and Melbourne office? They can be from time to time. It depends on kind of what's happening at the moment. What I'll do is I'll paste a link to the um, Australian careers in the chat for everyone. Um, and that will take you through to the opportunities that we've currently got advertised at the moment um, because they're the ones specific to the Australian business. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, thank you so much. No worries. Okay, and I might throw to Shanine next um, about consultancy and communications there. Hi. Yeah, my question was just regarding um, communications and consultancy based work in BAE. So, Ed, um, in terms of your experience, you were talking about um, just, you know, design work, but not like specific mechanical design work, like Jason threw that question. I was just wondering, is there a communication side to what the graduates get to experience during their program or their training? So do they actually get to talk to clients, find out their needs and stuff like that? Or is it just working under a supervisor based on project work that they get handed? Yeah, fair question. I have spoken to our, our customer being a customer being the, the Commonwealth of Australia. I think I could probably count it on, on one hand, to be honest, as a, as a graduate. So I have done it. Um, a lot of the time you'll sit in on meetings, um, maybe doing minutes or something where there is a customer present. Um, so you're kind of like one step removed, I guess. It generally ends up being your manager who ends up speaking to them. Having said that, though, I've taken a customer through a change I wanted to implement on a, on, a, on a Navy ship once. I had my slides up. It was just me doing it, talking for, you know, 20 or 30 minutes with them through a specific thing I wanted to do. So it, it exists. It depends on, I guess, what specific, I think it's a, not, not a great answer, but it depends on what you're working on, right? So if you're in a, a project where you're given a really specific task and you as the graduate become, happen to become the expert on that thing, um, right. which very well could happen, then it just makes sense that you should be the person who goes and presents it to the customer, right? Um, I didn't receive any training before I did that. It was just a matter of, you know, watching how other people have communicated with the customer and trying to emulate that sort of same attitude towards you know, how it's, how it's done. Um, so I guess, yeah, there isn't, there isn't a huge amount of it, at least not in the roles that I've had. Um, but okay. it definitely does, you know, the, the customer's present, I, I would say. It isn't like a, you spend three years only speaking to people from BAE. Like it's, it's a fairly close relationship with the, at least the projects I've worked on. Right, thank you. Thanks, Shanine. Um, Carissa, Curta, um, question here about the development. Would you like to take stuff off mute? Hi, everybody. Um, I just had a question about uh, educational opportunities that you have at BAA Systems, um, particularly in terms of what do you offer graduates uh, in terms of furthering their skills or, or graduates that want to actually uh, strengthen their technical skills that they may not necessarily have when they um, accept the job? Like if they want to do more training, do you offer those programs? And if you do, what kind? Ed, are you happy if I maybe kick off and then you can talk about um, your particular experience is that all right? I actually might answer it first just the ones that I've done. Yeah, go step for out it. for one second. Um, <laughs> yeah, no so worries. So I, what, what trainings have I done? It's it's a matter of again, it's like how the there's a lot. Of, first of all, there's a whole lot of training you can do. It's internal and external run by people in BAE, run by other people. You have to get funding secured for it, so it has to relate to the role that you're doing. Um, so the stuff that I've managed to work my way into, um, there's a lot of safety training that I did, um, some of which was run via the UK. So you had people in the UK getting up at like three o'clock in the morning to train Australians in safety, which I don't know how you end up doing that, but they did. Um, and I did a bit of systems engineering training as well. So that's quite a popular one among graduates, um, particularly there's like a five part systems engineering training that you can do that goes over. It, it, like if you were to do the entire thing compressed, it'd probably be about two or three weeks worth of training, but yeah, you, know, you have to have years of experience behind that to get sort of a proper, um, 
glimpse of everything. Um, so that, that could end up in a formal qualification that you can use to become a systems engineer. So that's a really good one for, I think, pretty much any graduate engineer to do because it's it really goes hand in hand with any sort of mechanical, electrical, whatever work you end up doing, project management, anything, um, knowing that stuff. What else is there? I've just signed up for some sustainment engineering and some stuff around maintainability because I'm about to go into like a testing sort of role. So really it's like a, we have a big search engine basically, if you can imagine that. And then we just type, you type in the sort of stuff that you're interested in and then you can do it. I'm actually about to do one on uh, persuasive communication so I can learn to be more persuasive. Um, but in terms of how you end up doing it, it's a matter of you get your manager's approval and then they have to find some money to secure you to do it. But in my experience, if you have a decent reason for doing it, then you can. So is that self-directed or is that at the discretion of your supervisor to do those skills? Both, actually. So some of them I just thought, hey, this looks good. I know someone who's done it. I go to my manager and go, hey, this looks cool. It kind of relates to my role in this way. I can do it. And in other ways, it's like a manager will say, oh, I think it'd be good for my entire team to do this particular training. And they'll, they'll get okay, fair enough. All right, I'll be back in one second. Thank you. No problem, Zed. I think it answered that question perfectly, but... Um, I think to add to that, yeah, we do offer um, a range of um, training, not only for technical skills, but also in the graduate program for um, the personal development side of things. So mm -hmm. things like um, communication, presenting in groups, um, some of those more soft skills, um, they're kind of taught through a series of modules. Um, and yeah, as Ed was saying, it's a combination of, you know, self-driven, I here's an area that I need to improve in. Here's a course I can do. Can I do it? And the business, yes or no, depending on, you know, their reasoning. Um, and other times the business identifies it as like a skills gap and, and um, that happens that way as well. Cool. Thank you very much. No worries. I'm going to throw to um, Alexander Tolmay next for a question about relocations and um, rotations. Oh, Hi. Uh, my name's Alex. I just had a question with uh, the rotations. Um, potentially, we could be moving for those. Is that common? Do they typically try to keep you to one area, one state? What sort of happens there? Yeah, great question. I wouldn't say um, it's common to be completely honest, but um, they are um, offered and assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so I'm not sure if Ed's just come back. I'm not sure if he's possibly done any... Um, any of his rotations interstate, um, but they, they can be, um, you know, offered from time to time. Um, there's usually a set number per, per rotation um, that the business likes to offer. Um, and I guess the justification behind that is, you know, if there's certain projects that will help you gain skills and experience in certain areas um, to help with your career progression and that sort of thing, then we'll um, do our best to accommodate that. Um, but as I'm sure you can understand, we can't um, relocate every graduate, every rotation, um, because we're not broke. <laughs> I didn't yeah, hear just... the start of this question. Uh, sorry, but I just to confirm, I haven't done any interstate rotations. I have done work in two different offices in both Williamstown and Richmond, which you want to look at a map of Melbourne, that may as well be interstate rotation. Uh, but I've also never asked for one. So I never actually pursued um, getting an interstate rotation. One of my rotations actually was completely at home during you know, the middle of Victorian lockdown. And my entire team was in Adelaide. Um, so I don't know if you want to call that an interstate rotation. It was working on a completely South Australian project. Um, but yeah, maybe not quite the same thing that you're talking about. Uh, just touching on that. Um, so if there was relocation, you seem to be hinting that there was some sort of like relocation assistance with that. Would that be the case? Yeah, they can be. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I guess, the reason why it's um, assessed and offered on a case-by-case -case basis, um, because a company wouldn't expect graduates to be able to fund uh, you know, six months in a different location, um, completely on their own. Awesome. Thank you very much. No worries. Alan Nguyen, I might throw to you next. Um, a great question. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, hey, Ed, I've got a question. It might be a bit of a personal one, but okay. I'm interested to know what your day in the life is kind of like, you know, within work, outside of work as well. Uh, you don't have to talk about your weekend, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, just just interested to see what, what life would be like. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good question. I think um, I'm going to start by saying, I think, and I haven't really worked at many other companies, I think BAE has one of the better work-life balances available, um, certainly while you're in the, at least the level that I'm at as a graduate or recent graduate. Um, these days, uh, in the role I'm in, I'll talk about maybe the last week or so of what I've been doing. Um, I spend maybe one or two days a week on average in the office, 
so in the Richmond office and I spend the rest in here. I don't know if you can tell, this isn't the BAE office, this is just my bedroom um, where I work. Uh, and that's split apart, it's split by sort of needing to be in the office to do certain physical things. So because the role I'm on at the moment is transitioning into like an expert in test equipment and sort of production parts of the null curve system. It means I'm working on testing for obsolescence for certain bits on a on basically a, a circuit board or a piece of equipment, which means I have to be in a lab plugging things in. And so I have to go in for a few days of that. So that involves um, things like formal testing where I'll be in um, a lab with someone helping me. So that'd be maybe a graduate at this point. It feels weird having a graduate being someone help you when you were a graduate like two months ago, but that's what I'm doing at the moment. I've got that, uh, that person there and then there'll be a witness watching me sort of plug things into a board and signing things off as I do them, which is part of our sort of qualification testing. That'll turn into a report, which goes through an online sort of repository where you have to get that approved by certain people and signed and stuff. Um, there's a fair bit of writing up procedures for other testing that needs to be done, thinking about how to best put a document together out of a template um, to I guess, capture a requirement or something that you need to do, then getting that reviewed by people, addressing comments that people have, making sure everybody's happy with the product that you put together. So it's a, yeah, everything, everything's collaborative basically that we work on. So there's that stuff. Um, if I'm completely honest today, I'm just waiting for people to review stuff that I have. And I've actually told my manager this morning that I didn't have any work to do, which is one of the reasons why I ended up here because I thought, hey, I've got an extra hour that I can spend doing this. Um, that doesn't happen very often. Most of the time you're, you're doing stuff. Um, but yeah, I've spent today looking at um, different trainings and stuff I can do, reading up on a few um, documents and things, just sort of, I guess like extra stuff because I didn't have any, you know, actual actual work to do. I'm just waiting for other people to, to finish stuff for me. Um, so that's what I'm up to at the moment. I guess outside of work, what do I do? I play, I'm a musician. I played guitar in like a band that's, that hasn't done any gigs yet, but we were kind of a band. Uh, I play netball, I've got a netball game in two days. My feet are still healing from last week because we just got back in. Um, I go running a fair bit. I play a lot of video games. Um, I have a lot of hobbies, which is one of the, like I said, one of the reasons why I work life balance is, I mean, it's important to everybody, but it's extremely important to me because I want to be able to, you know, pursue all the things I love doing outside of work. And I've generally found that um, I, I can, especially with this, this remote sort of flexible working thing where, you know, my commute is zero minutes. Um, it's, it's pretty good. Sweet. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm conscious we've got about five minutes left of the allotted time. Now, Brenna and Ed have both said to me um, prior to, we might be able to stay a little bit longer as well, um, but we will probably start wrapping up relatively soon, next you know, 15, 20 minutes or so. So if you've got any last questions, get them in now. If I've missed yours um, for whatever reason, get them in again, because I'm dealing with a lot on the chat box at the moment. Um, and again, reiterate whether or not you're happy to take yourself off mute, because uh, I probably will prioritize those. Just, just putting that out there. Um, while we, while those are coming in, I might clear a few of the quick questions and read them out myself. Um, there's a question here about cybersecurity. As much roles in, in cybersecurity, Brenner at BAE. Yeah, so um, for BAE Systems Australia, there's not an awful lot right at the moment, um, but applied intelligence are definitely looking for uh, cybersecurity people at the moment in uh, Victoria, Canberra, New South Wales. Um, so those opportunities are also listed on our BAE Systems Australia website at the moment um, under ICT engineering. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about the mentorship opportunities at BAE? Yeah, so I think I did see that comment about, um, so that sounds more like when people are at an undergraduate level. Um, unfortunately, that's not something that we do too much of um, formally. Um, because it's obviously quite difficult to manage and, and organize and that sort of thing. Um, but there are some, um, some members of the team who do arrange that sort of thing directly through universities. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna to throw to Robert now, so happy to unmute your question there. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I was just uh, more so curious because I know we've spoken a bit about the exit roles. Um, but when initially entering into the graduate program, does the successful applicant have any input over the like four project rotations that they're going to be involved in over the two year period? Um, like, is there a pool of projects that they might be able to choose from or is it mostly decided by um, 
uh, the company based on, say, your interview or your um, your application, your degree, and where they think that it might be best for you to, to jump into initially? Yeah, so in terms of rotation one, um, it is more of that, um, you know, we've assessed your skills, your degree, um, and it is, it is slightly more of a, you know, let's pop them in this position to start with. Um, because when you haven't started with the company, quite often you don't know just quite the number of opportunities that there are. So, yeah. um, and it would be quite difficult to kind of um, manage expectations in terms of, you know, um, well, I, w- I only want to work on this project to start with or, you know, whatever that may be. Um, and the important thing to remember with that as well is that um, you're joining the graduate program as a BA systems graduate, not just a a hunter class graduate or a drawn yeah. graduate you're going you're going to potentially go on you know many of those projects um in terms of rotations as they go on so add as ed was saying before um a lot of it does come down to what positions are available on that project what what sort of budget do they have like which is you know do they have positions um but there is definitely an element of you know if i go on this project that's going to give me this experience and help me develop these skills um, so where we can, it definitely is that sort of two-way approach, um, but it can be tricky because we do have quite quite large cohorts and, you know, w- to try and understand everyone's needs and wants and that sort of thing and put them in the best positions. Um, the team do the best they can and um, they're looking at implementing systems to help with that. Um, but yeah, it is, you know, you're a BAE systems graduate, there's four rotations. So if you don't get, you know, your ideal rotation in this one, you know, it could be the next one or things yeah. like that. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. No worries. Going to throw to Kelvin next. A question here about um, overseas opportunities. Yeah. Hello, Brennan. Yeah. Ed, just wondering. It's probably more of like an after you after you've exited your graduate program, but since BAE is a global company, just wondering if there are any opportunities to move overseas to other BAE system branches. Yeah, so there's definitely opportunities um, available to do that. So, um, and it and it goes both ways. So sometimes BA Systems Australia employees will go to the say the UK business, and they might come to us as well. So, um, those sort of opportunities definitely do go up. Um, one of our directors um, for the Australian business has just um, recently announced a comment that he's going to do um, over over in the um, UK business, um, and yeah that's not just limited for directors. Um, that was the most recent example that I could think of, but um, yeah, it is something that we can look into. Right, thank you very much. No worries. I'm gonna to throw to Adam Gao next. Um, if you're happy to take yourself off mute. Hey guys, how you going? Um, so I was just, um, Ed mentioned that um, you do spend a lot of time working at home. Um, is that usual? Or is that just because of uh, COVID at the moment? It seems quite accessible for everyone. You don't have to be in the office every day. Yeah, I was looking at this one before, I was because it's like, it kind of turned into a philosophical one for me. Like, is it is it usual because of COVID now? <laughs> if you know yeah. what I mean. Um, I, I can tell you during the, the year or so before COVID hit, when I was at the AE, I worked from home maybe twice. And that was just um, like one day, I'd just gotten back from an overseas flight. Hey, crazy, remember when those could happen. And um, the other time was, I think just, I can't remember what the other time was for. It was more like a, but having said that, there I've had managers who choose to work from home before all this happened. They chose to work from home one or two days a week. Um, that was reasonably common. I wouldn't say it's, you know, something everybody did, but it's certainly something that was possible. Um, I can tell you at least in the office that I'm in, there isn't really a huge push to get everybody back into the office five days a week. It isn't like a, you must be here this many days a week or anything like that. It's definitely been a lot more, at least in my experience, um, leaning it with that regard. It's like, you know, it's realistic in that if you can get your work done, your work can be done remotely. I'm not sure what the exact business stance on, on it is at the moment. I think I, <laughs> I would imagine they're probably still trying to work it out. Um, but yeah, I can, I can just only, I, I can really only speak from my experience, which is that it's reasonably fluid, at least at the moment as to what it'll be like in a year, two years time. Um, you know, it's, we can speculate. Um, if I had to guess, I'd say I don't think remote working is going to disappear completely. But I mean, that's, you know, for people who get paid more than me to decide. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thanks for that. It's definitely true. Um, true what Ed says. So before COVID, um, I used to think it was really awesome that I could work from home like one or two days a week. I used to think that was the absolute best. 
Um, and now to, I only do a day or two in the office. So, um, and that's purely for myself. I love that team interaction. I don't need it every day, but I do need it, you know, at least once a week. <laughs> so I'm a bit needy in that regard. But um, yeah, we use that more of a, like a team day. So our team meetings are on that day. We make sure that, you know, um, if we're going in, the team will be in because otherwise we can sit at home alone or the office alone. So um, yeah, we're, we're all delivering on our work. And I think like Ed says, um, looking into the future, it's still a bit hard to see where it will kind of fall. Um, but for now, it seems like we're definitely embracing, um, you know, this working from home and um, still utilising the office because there's definitely sometimes where, you know, you, um, that meeting room space or that, you know, face-to-face -face interaction is definitely beneficial. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Next, I'm going to go to Jason. Um, I think it Got another question. Hi, Ed. Um, you were talking about your work-life balance a bit earlier. Um, just a quick question on that. How often do you find yourself working overtime? Well, wow. so let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's start with the um, what, what it says in the contract when you sign it, which is that you're working, if you're working full-time at BAE, it's a 38-hour week plus what they call reasonable overtime. And I've yet to find anybody in the entire company who can tell me what that actually means. Um, in my experience, I would say like not very often, um, but that's not something that's shared by everybody in the company, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, some people choose to work overtime because they think they can just you know get more work done. It comes down to, I think, a question of how hard you're working in, in some cases, like can you get everything done within your 38 hours? I'm personally of the view that if you have to be working overtime, there's maybe something wrong with the workload you're being given in the first place. Um, I have not really, at least not, certainly not at a graduate level, I've not really heard of people who are consistently forced to work, you know, or not forced to, but consistently find themselves under a workload that sort of requires them to work you know 40 45 50 hour weeks or whatever regularly certainly you know if you get to a point in the project where you're coming out to a big review or you're coming up to a big, a big deadline or, or so forth um you might find yourself you know work, staying back a couple an hour or something or whatever but i've never ever i can stress there's never been in a, a circumstance where you know i've been sat next to my manager in the office or something and you know felt pressured to not go home because i think i'm not delivering enough for the team or whatever if you're doing your hours you're doing work in those hours like you might say there's unspoken things you know you get into this whole oh, are people like pressuring me like or are people talking about me behind my back about how i'm not doing enough work or anything like that and you can get all into it but i can tell you from my experience anyway, I've never felt that way. I've never felt like people are thinking I'm not doing enough work. And I do pretty much bang on my 38 hours every week. And I, and I try and stick to that. I try not to go over time because I'm worried about what's going to happen to my life and my soul <laughs> if, I, if I keep doing that. <laughs> so that's me after two years. Maybe in 10 years' time I'll have changed or if I lose some of my hobbies or interests in things outside of work. But at the moment, that's that's where I'm at personally. So to answer your questions at the beginning, almost, almost never. Um, Obviously, if you, you might end up in, depends on if you actually, I might, might mention, if you work on certain projects that are based out of the UK or the US, you might be having some weird um, meetings outside of normal work hours. Um, whether you call that overtime, I don't know, because you could then, you know, just work a bit less during the day or, or something. Um, like I know people who go to like 7 or 9 p.m. meetings occasionally um, just because they're working on certain projects that require that, but I haven't had to do that uh, yet. Yep. That was a really good Thanks, point that Ed just um, mentioned at the end there about that flexibility and um, that definitely is something that the company prides themselves on. So um, I have been the the suspect of a few UK meetings. So, um, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night could be doing a meeting um, or even for myself as, um, as a recruiter, attending a lot of expos and that sort of thing, quite often they can be out of hours. Um, or say if I was at the big meet um, last week, um, that was a whole day out of the office. So, you know, I did a couple of hours that night just to, you know, catch back up and make sure I was on top of things. Um, but then for me, what I do is, you know, at a time that's suitable. So obviously not when things are due or deliverables um, need to be met. Um, but it could mean that, you know, if I need to head off an hour early or, you know, I need to duck out for an appointment, I just do that because um, we're definitely treated like adults. So yeah, that's just my perspective as well. Actually, one thing I might just mention, this is the, this is the worst it got for me. This was like maybe three years into my graduate, pro three weeks into my graduate program, sorry. I was uh, sent to Western Australia to do a few customer meetings and also walk on a ship over there, which is where they do some of the actual physical work on um, on the, the Anzac ships. And I was there for, I think it was 
three days. Um, but probably worked the equivalent of five days worth of hours while I was there. And that was just because we had presentations to come up with that, you know, we hadn't finished because we didn't have the information we needed because we needed to get it when we were over there and there are a whole lot of reasons behind it, such to the point that we're, you know, getting up at five in the morning and working, you know, in some way or another until quite late into the night. Having said that, though, when we got back, one of the uh, more senior guys I was with went to a manager at the time and spoke to him about it and just said, look, you can count these hours like look at these like 16 hour days that we've been working and he eventually agreed to give us time in lieu for that and so it ended up bouncing out and there was no sort of you know i suppose you wouldn't necessarily even call that overtime in some ways yeah thanks that's a really good insight into the culture all right um next question there's a question from um garakai there regarding um whether or not the graduate program is just for you know fresh grads, you know, a couple of years out of, you know, et cetera, or is it open to career changes as long as they've done a the degree in recent years? Brenna, my Abs you. Yeah, absolutely. So as long as people um, have graduated from their degree, it's definitely open to you. Um, what I would probably suggest there is in things like your cover letter um, to make it clear about your intentions um, and interest in applying for the graduate program. So um, that's really the best way for you to sell yourself and, um, you know, put forward your best foot and let us know about why, why you're the best person for the job. And is there a particular, do they have to have graduated within a certain number, number of years or? There's not um, a set, a set time frame. No. Okay, awesome. Um, I'll throw next to Ray a question about data engineering roles. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, I just wanted to know where data engineers is being offered. This question will be to Brenna. So, yeah. um, so the data engineering opportunity that we're advertising at the moment, um, I think the preference is for it to be based in um, New South Wales, but there is potential for it to be based um, in um, Victoria or SA as well. Great. Thank you. No worries. Um, next question here from MD Adeswula. Um, and it looks like Reese had a similar question, but I might sort of um ending first let's see if i can still on there we go just asked to unmute oh uh, yeah hello everyone um yeah so basically i graduate halfway through next year and i was wondering if i should apply for the 22 graduate 2022 graduate program or the 2023 graduate program yeah, that's a really good question. So um, unfortunately, you would need to wait for the 2023 program um, because we require you to finish by the end of this year. No, all right, awesome. Thank you. No worries. But there's definitely um, the internship program to keep an eye out for that could, you know, give you a bit of experience um, in the meantime. All right. I might finish up with Chi about, um, and then I've got one more question for both Brenna and Ed. Um, actually, just what... I can see a very quick one. William asked, happy, you know, are there any roles for July 2021 or is it just for? Um, just for 2022, yeah. 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 Um, and then, so I might throw it back to Chi then for a question about further events that BA, BA you might be doing. Yeah, Hello that's again. a really good question. Uh, Hi, Chi, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to ask, yes. Um, I'm always on the lookout for these events where I can talk to people so um, I sorry that's my them? dog sorry so events yeah yeah yep that's a really good question so um we've got on our um, graduate career page which hopefully i've got the link for just here um if you scroll to the bottom it will show you a list of the events events that we're attending um, in terms of ones that are coming up, we've got the um, Engineers Australia Elevation event in both Adelaide and Melbourne. So there'll be BA system staff at both of those. Um, and we've also got um, two of the super fairs with um, Grad Australia. So the engineering one, um, which is tomorrow, and then the technology one as well, which is um, the following week. Are there any events outside of career related stuff, like where I can see the actual projects people have been working on? Um, not off the top of my head, but I believe there might be some that are coming out later in the year um, at our Edinburgh Parks office and also possibly William Town as well in New South Wales. Um, do you know where I could keep track of these? Um, that's a really good question. I'm not too sure where they're being advertised at the moment, um, but I'll definitely just keep an eye on our careers website. That's probably where they'll go. 
Thanks. Awesome. Um, so that was super fair, by the way, that's, I've just posted a link there to Great Australia, you can register there, um, and BA will be presenting at that. And I think you might be potentially speaking for a certain part of the tech fair as well, which would be exciting. Um, final question from me, um, and I'll throw it to you both, and I might start with Ed first and foremost. Okay. Um, you know, what's, what's your favourite thing about working at BA and why <laughs> should grads consider joining the graduate or intern program? Okay. My softball I, for you. I'm trying to think of um, what I said in my interview when I, when I applied for this <laughs> this job. Because <laughs> you get asked, like, any job you apply for, it's like, why do you want to work here? Um, I think I touched on this a bit earlier um, today. Um, and it really is the, the, the one of the best reasons, which is that it's a big company, right? It's the, by some measures, the biggest defence company in Australia. Um, the project that I'm working on is Australia's biggest defence export. Um, and size, while it has its downsides, so you can, you know, basically run into this this issue of not knowing where to look for the things that you need to find and being bogged down by processes and so forth. It also means there's a whole lot of stuff you can do, right? I mean, like if, you, if I go back over the stuff that I've done, I've been to WA and walked on a ship. I've like sat in front of a big, huge vibrating table looking at, you know, a graph of how this thing is behaving. I've, you know, developed a huge part of a safety program for a radar project working entirely remotely with people whose faces I've never seen. I've done a whole lot of stuff that I never thought I would be doing um, when I took this job, which I think is not something you could say for taking a, a role at like a smaller, I guess, you know, company. Um, not to say that there's, you know, not benefits there, but that to me is one of the things that drew me here. Not only because we work on a whole lot of cutting edge, really cool, you know, stuff, um, but also that there's a huge breadth of stuff to get involved in. And with any graduate program, that's, I think, the number one goal that you should have if you get it, like, lucky enough to get into one. Do as many different things as you possibly can. Um, I think I've done that and I've got no regrets for it, really. Um, I didn't, like, like I mentioned earlier, I didn't do a lot of mechanical engineering during my graduate program. And I haven't got any regrets for that either because I ended up exiting as a mechanical engineer anyway. I've got the rest of my life to be a mechanical engineer. Why would I spend these two years where I can be whatever I want doing that? So... Um, it's yeah, it's the breadth of opportunity would be the I guess the bullet point of, of my response there. Awesome. Thanks, Ed. Renner, same question. Favorite thing about BA, or, or why should you know grads consider a role with you? I think Ed stole all of my points. Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to think of something different. Um, but I think yeah, like you mentioned, just the opportunities. Um, you know, there's a really big range of projects that you can work on. Um, for myself. Um, probably many of you won't find it interesting being a HR spin, but just in case. Um, so even, um, you know, from the HR side of things, I've had the opportunity to work on um, a number of um, projects within the company. So I did um, a succumbent into John phase six to help with their ramp up of um, FIFO workers to work on the, um, um, on the radar sites um, in remote locations across Australia. Um, I've been in and out of the graduate space, but I um, always seem to find myself back here, which is really exciting. Um, you know, it's a really, really great space to work in. Um, and, you know, the opportunities and the development that I've got throughout the time um, are the things that I've really enjoyed. And then, you know, there's the, there's the cultural things um, that we've been speaking about. So the work-life balance, um, flexibility and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we might wrap it up there, to be honest. Thanks, everyone, for um, coming along today and saying a little bit extra as well. These are great questions. Um, glad to get through most of them. Apologies if you missed yeah. any. Um, but, I mean, as, as we sort of said before, you know, check out the website, um, bring up further questions in the recruitment process as well. Um, any other places that might be able to send further questions, Brenda, or...? Yeah, um, so our website should have most of the key information. Um, so just to quickly throw in, I saw a couple of last minute questions about closing dates and that sort of thing. So um, if you head to our BAE Systems Australia careers page, which I've posted the link to a few times, um, that will show you all of the opportunities that we've got at the moment. They do close on Easter Monday, um, so the 5th of April. Um, and then internship program opens up later in the year in about August. So um, yeah, just if there's any questions, head to the website. Hopefully that will help you out. Um, and if not, there should be a little email address there to get you through to um, the early careers team. Awesome. Well, thanks, Brenna. Thanks, Ed. And thanks again to everyone for, for your time today. We'll wrap it up there, I reckon. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good luck.